1 Timothy 1, 12. I thank Christ, Jesus our Lord, who has given me strength that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Now to the eternal king, the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Luke 5 verse 27. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Okay, so there was an attitude that tax collectors were sinners. And on the other hand, there was this attitude that the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were somehow righteous. But were the Pharisees and the teachers of the law righteous? And were tax collectors, in the end, able to be changed? Well, yeah, actually. And the Pharisees and the teachers of the law and the Sadducees were not able to be changed, were they? So listen to what Jesus says. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, is it not that it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick? I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Oh, look at the way he says that. Sinners to repentance. And who is he talking about with regard to the righteous? Is anyone righteous, guys? Come on, let's think about this. Because there's something being taught in counterfeit Christianity that God calls the sinners, that he chooses the sinners. I heard this argument being used with regard to Lonnie Frisbee, who was engaging in homosexuality, and people say, oh, goodness, he was just so good and did so much of the Lord's work. How? How? Is that who God calls? God says people are handed over to homosexuality and unnatural behaviors because of idolatry. God did not use Lonnie Frisbee. That is counterfeit Christianity. God is not choosing you because you are a sinner. That is so stupid. To say that someone who deliberately goes on sinning, that that is the person that God chooses to serve in his house. The word says that anyone who serves in his house has to be above reproach and their own house has to be in order. So how could that possibly be? No. What he's saying here, he is likening a sinner to someone who is sick. And indeed, that's true. They are sick. We were sick when we went around deliberately sinning and living as evil people. What is Jesus saying? No one's righteous, but there are people like the Pharisees, Sadducees, and teachers of the law who thought they were righteous, weren't there? That's what he's saying. And why would he call them? He's not going to call them because their hearts are hardened. They're not his. His sheep know his voice and hear him, and they don't follow a stranger. They follow him. But those who have been hardened, those who don't have a heart for God, they are not his. They are children of the devil, and their desire is to do what the devil wants. He's not literally saying that they're righteous. He's saying that they believe they're righteous. The sinners, he's saying they know that they're sinners. Everybody's a sinner, but look what he says. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Do you understand what repentance is? Because counterfeit Christianity doesn't seem to be educating very well about this. John the Baptist said, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. What is the fruit of repentance? It's change. It means that you don't deliberately go on sinning. And Paul says, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God for those who deliberately go on sinning after they've received the knowledge of the truth. Okay, so let me give you an example. Those who keep submitting themselves to medicine and medications, pharmacia, you know that that's not right. You know that that is a field that denies that there's a creator. You know that our creator has said, I will not put any of these diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians. If you follow me and obey me, I am the Lord who heals you. You say you believe that he is the creator, but you don't believe that he can heal you. 
So what is Jesus saying when he says it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick? Is he talking about this current medical system? Is that what he's talking about? So like if something happens, you know, you get a scrape or you get a wound or something like that. And a person who tends to the body comes and cleans up that wound, bandages it up, puts some olive oil on it for soothing and bandages it up. Might we call that person a doctor or a physician? But is a doctor or a physician in the Bible the same thing that it is today? No, guys. What is being practiced today has always been witchcraft. It was introduced by the Greeks. When the Bible says, Luke, the beloved physician, do you think that Luke followed Jesus in his ministry? And then, you know, after Jesus died, he was like, well, that was what Jesus did. Never mind that. And he gets out his prescription pad or his tinctures and his potions and his pharmacia and he says well this is what we're gonna do never mind that god's your healer you know god just you know god was just wasting his breath he was blowing hot air when he said that come on you're not supposed to go to anything for healing but god anything that you go to for healing is an idol it's an entirely different thing like my friend naomi when uh when we were sick and you know had defiled ourselves a couple weeks back she sent me a recipe for which she calls stinky tea. And she said, I'm not sending this to you for healing. I'm sending it to you for relief because it does tend to help you to breathe a little better and it'll soothe your throat. Does that replace the work I'm supposed to be doing with God? Do I now think, oh, this is going to kill all that bacteria and this is what's going to heal me? Nope, totally different thing. The word does allow us to do certain things in order to soothe. God does not allow us to go to idols to tell us whether we're going to live or die or to go to them for healing or to let them cut us open and break down the temple and pour poison down our throat. It's a totally different thing. That is not what was going on during Jesus' time. That is not what he was referring to and that is not what Luke was doing. Jesus preached repentance when he healed people. Luke preached the same thing. If you've been enlightened... If you've been told these things and you deliberately go on sinning, there is no what? No sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. You don't believe in him. You've made yourself an enemy of God. Luke 18 verse 9. To some who were confident of their own righteousness... So he's, again, addressing the difference between sinners and the righteous. Everybody's a sinner. No one's righteous. What he was addressing are those who think they're righteous, who set themselves up as being righteous. That's what Jesus was talking about. He was talking about, I've come for to call the sinners to repentance. Those who know that they are sinners and that are going to do the work to change. Those who think they're righteous won't. In fact, they were so stupid that they thought they were justified before Jesus and that they could go and kill him and somehow escape the flaming fires of hell. Is that going to happen? Uh, no. Verse 9. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Ooh. He's addressing the same thing in Luke 18 that was being presented in Luke 5. The Pharisees who thought they were righteous who were looking down on the tax collectors. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like the other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. I mean, come on, congratulations. That's going to save you? I mean, today in counterfeit Christianity, you can... Go and engage in debauchery all week, and then you can go to Sunday counterfeit Sunday Sabbath. Raise your hands in the air, get dressed in your Sunday best, put a little money in the basket, and you're just all good. Go pay those indulgences off. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. I'm going to tell you right now, it turns out 
that this covenant is a heck of a lot harder than we even thought. Than we even thought. And the word says it's hard for the righteous to be saved. Easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get into the kingdom of heaven. What in the world have we believed, guys? We have been stupid. We have not taken God at his word. That there is a cross to bear. That our houses must be in order in order for us to work in his house. And guess what? That's the whole point of us being saved is to go work in his house as a priest of God. Hello. And so if your house is not in order and you can't even be conf confronted about it to change, you are not going to make it. You lie to excuse yourself. You are not going to make it. That is a form of judgment called discernment. It is a form of judgment that I am commanded to make. And so are you. The judgment you are not allowed to participate in is condemnation. God can turn that person, but if they continue in that behavior, the word tells me they won't make it. If you are lying, you're not going to make it unless you repent and actually change because that's the fruit of repentance. Liars, cowards, those who practice magic arts, these people will not make it into the kingdom of heaven. Plain and simple. I would think that that would mean something to certain people. I would think that they would have enough sense to understand that crying about the fact that you don't connect with God, crying about the fact that you're not getting this, that isn't going to justify you. No one's going to change your situation, but you returning to God. God does not choose sinners. He calls sinners to repentance. He does not choose sinners. He chooses those who were called to repentance who actually repent, which means their house is in order. They pick up their cross. They pick up their covenant. They do the things that he said. They obey because they actually believe in him and they are then activated in the purpose for which he has set them apart. There is the evidence that they have actually done these things. That's the fruit of being a good tree. They are not using their anointing incorrectly if they've been anointed. That's a very stupid thing to say. It's without understanding because God does not anoint those he has not chosen. That is his seal of approval on them. Don't you remember that Simon the sorcerer wanted this gift and he was like ready to pay Peter for it? And Peter said, yeah, like, you know, Peter kind of laid him out, exposed him and said that he had bitterness in his heart and shamed him because he was thinking that he could buy the gift of God. Hello, guys. How do you get the gifts of God? Those gifts are for God. They are to use for the purpose for which he has set you apart. And when you have respected, obeyed, submitted, repented, then he activates you in the purpose for which he set you apart. And he gives you gifts in order to enact that task for which you've been set apart. And Paul says each person has been given a task. That anointing is the seal of approval. That anointing is God saying, this one is mine and they are doing my work. So there have been people who've come on the channel and they're like, oh, you act like you're overly anointed. I don't know what that means. I don't like the way you talk to me. God doesn't talk to me like that. You ain't hearing from God, honey. That's the reason he had to send people to talk to you. No one has ever liked the way God's servants talk or the message they speak. That's why they kill his prophets. And God wouldn't have to send you prophets if you were listening to him. He always sends his prophets when destruction is about to take place. God does nothing without warning through his prophets first. What does that mean? It means he sends prophets to warn you because you haven't been listening to him. God does not choose anybody who deliberately goes on sinning. And I will tell you from personal experience that if you are his, and particularly if you are in a position of serving, like he's brought you through to that position for which he has called you, oh my goodness, he deals so sternly with his servants when they step a little to the left or a little to the right on their own. He does not let me deliberately go on sinning. He does not let me do that. I am always in communication with God. 
He is always dealing with me on every thought, on every imagination, on every behavior. He is always contending with me. And if he's not doing that with you, you had better return to him. No amount of delusion in counterfeit Christianity is going to save. Please discern this message with God.